Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Uh, this session, we're going to look in the book of uh, Second Chronicles. It is the reign of Zedekiah, the last of the kings of Judah. And I want to start with about verse uh, 13. Get your Bible, turn to Second Chronicles uh, chapter 36, verse 13. Speaking of Zedekiah. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear an oath by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more, according to all the abominations of the nations, and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, raising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, till there was no more remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. What a sad ending yes. to the... These are, the people people, of Judea. Yeah, these are the people who are left to, to, to defend Solomon's temple and Jerusalem, and this is what's going on. They basically have turned Solomon's temple into a place to worship idols and carry on pagan practices and so forth. And what does God do under those circumstances? Well, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people. Now mm -hmm. we can try to sort out what that is. <laughs> yes. Roman, Romans 1 and Hosea 11, he gives them up. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go there either. You can go back to Judges 2 and 3, and it's spelled out pretty clearly. Well, here's the question which really jumps out at us at Second Chronicles. Remember the Second Chronicles, we're talking about the final days of, of Judah, really, um, before the, before the downfall, well, before the Babylonian captivity. And what has the universe learned? What has God accomplished by working with the Jews? He's been working with them now for some 800 years at least since they, uh, came, out about, since they came out of Egyptian slavery. What has God accomplished? Are his promises to Abraham and, and David, are they defunct now? I mean, has God just given up on them? Uh, was there any hope of reviving this nation? I mean, uh, if you read on, you'll see that he left Jerusalem, Babylon, uh, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar left Jerusalem in, in a state of rubble. He just flattened everything. I'm, I'm tired. This is the third time he had to come back and, and attack the city. He just r turned the whole city into rubble. He said, I don't want anything more to do with these. I don't want people living here. I don't want anything more to do with this city. And he flattened it. So what do you say if you're a Jew at that point? Do you think that um, all the promises given to Abraham was actually fulfilled at that, to that point? No. Why? Why would because, you say that? Because if you, you go back, you'll see 
Abraham, the promise to Abraham is, I will give you this, this country, you will have it, uh, uh, you, you're supposed to spread the gospel to the whole world, all nations will come and worship before you, etc., etc. Well, in the way... When did that happen? Solomon's time. They were the most powerful nation in the world, arguably. For a little while. For a little while. Maybe. And, and, and um, they did become like the sands of the sea. Mm -hmm. Everything physical, kind of what Abraham thought the promise was, well, I, I can't read his mind, but yeah. all the physical things, you know, that, yeah. that's talked about seem to have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. It's almost like God made it happen in spite of them. And then after it happened, well, then he let it go to, to reap its normal consequence. That's kind of how I'm seeing it, but I don't know if that's a good way to do it well, or not. He, he certainly did reach a high point under David and Solomon in terms of God's fulfillment of prophecy. And that's, that's what they wanted to come back to with the Messiah. And? Did it happen? No, it didn't happen, but, but my point is that they did reach a high point there that was a standard that they wanted to come back to later. Sure. So yeah. maybe um, God did fulfill, in a sense, my question is this, if you're an angel from heaven and you're looking down and you're watching what's going on here, would you say, God, you're really succeeding? Yes, because God said he would take the smallest people, the weakest, mm -hmm. and certainly that's the case there. Now they're going off into Babylonian captivity. And so now God can bring them back and make them into a strong people. Did he really? I mean, if you're he, an he, angel. Looking, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> a little more well, foresight, well, on the on the outside, it looks like it it happened, doesn't it? It just only but the, only the like deep what? part did not happen. We're, we're we're looking. I mean, we're going to come in a few weeks to the very end of the Old Testament. We're going to take another look. <clears throat> what happened like 300, 200 years later? But it doesn't look like we're winning very much. It looks like we've come from. It looks like. Exodus and the Babylonian captivity are sort of bookends to the history of Israel. They came out of slavery, they've gone back into slavery. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, did God ever really think it was going to be <laughs> different than this? No, I, I didn't ask what God thought. I asked what did the angels think. Now, God knew in advance what was coming. What about the angel standing around God's throne? Well, you know, even, even from an angel's viewpoint, who's been around watching this from, I mean, this is just, a, this is the same song, third verse, you know, we create Adam and Eve, they only louse things up. You come down and you make this uh, uh, a big deal with Abraham and, and his family louses things up. Mm -hmm. um, then we finally come up with a nation, and they get pretty strong, and now they've loused things up. Mm -hmm. And we tell those lies, don't we? And you know, it's it's uh, just uh, that seems to be not only the history of 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 these particular things I've mentioned, but it also seems to be the history of of the world. Isn't that what's going to happen in? The and things are so well, loused it, it, up that... It looks, yeah, it looks like every time God starts over, eventually it crumbles. And then he starts over and it crumbles. He starts over, it crumbles. He starts over, it crumbles. So, Before so, I answer your question, uh -huh. I'd want to know what the discussions were around that throne up there. Mm -hmm. Was God opening to them and saying, look, here's what's going to happen... Uh, a little at a time, maybe maybe they had multiple Senate meetings or something mm -hmm. in which which kept the angels in tune with what was going on, or was I don't think so. Why not? <laughs> because I read in Ellen White that they were amazed. They stood up there and they said, "God, why are you wasting your time with these people? Just wipe them out." Well, they I'm, thought they they were waiting. I can show you. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't they bring them. They could have said that when he told them what was going on. <laughs> yeah. They said, they looked up there and they said, we're, we're ready. Just give us permission and we'll zap them. Sure. 
What kind of heavenly beings are those? I'm just telling you. <laughs> are, are, these guys, are these guys spotless? I mean, we're supposed to be spotless. I mean, but that, is that something that we do if we get to heaven and say, man, those guys are a bunch of jerks. Let's wipe them out. That shows that those <laughs> that the age, heavenly beings had a lot of learning yet to do. Mm -hmm. That's why it wasn't until the cross they finally got it. Because and up till that time, it was purely a management problem. Okay, how can the entire universe be so well, but, befuddled over well, all this? And, and, I mean, <laughs> this is not a study of the New Testament. When we get over to Ephesians and Colossians, I'll show you. It says that right in Scripture. We don't look. No, we, have, I mean, it, we are so egocentric. We yeah. think that the whole great controversy is all about us. And it's not. If... if it's no wonder, I mean, if that was a frame of reference that they had, it's no wonder they was uh, suckered by Satan so easy. It's a wonder they all didn't follow. Yeah, you know, every, every generation <laughs> since creation until now, every generation has to learn it over and over again. I, I we have a lot more evidence that we have, have able to, to draw on. Well, you know, let me, let me follow that up. Is that, really, is that really what's happening here? Is that is that it's just a new generation. They learn something, and then there's a new generation comes along, just like we have new children. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they got, you know, they got to learn not to fall down and not to touch the hot things again. And, exactly. And so is that, is that what's happening? And if that's what's happening, then how, I mean, what, what, what kind of a learning curve are we expecting to happen here? What's kind of, we're going to expect to come along or the generation is going to be born and they're going to have to learn that they don't have to touch a hot stove because they know it all? What? Well, <laughs> the, the, fact, the fact that we haven't got it together yet is proven by the fact that we're still here and not in heaven yet. Well, what do we have to do to get together? That's the question we're trying to answer here. <laughs> That's exactly what, what, the question. What, 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 <laughs> we have, one of the things we have to do is we have to be willing to learn from the mistakes of others before us. We shouldn't have to make every mistake ourselves. We can't. We'd be wiped out. No, we can't. Out. There's too many people making too many mistakes. I shouldn't. I can't have, keep up with all. <laughs> I shouldn't have to learn for myself from experience that I can't touch that hot stove. I should be able to learn from your experience or yeah. someone else. So is that is that the answer right there? <laughs> that's part of it. And yeah, that's part really of it. We each answer. have the experience of knowing that we are sinners. Mm -hmm. And the only place we can go is to Christ to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Well, I So uh, in in that sense we're all equal. I think I think part of the lesson is that uh, and I'm not sure I can define it here but somehow we're stuck in in some kind of a situation that's almost not of our own doing. Uh, right, that's true. Um, and and I don't, five says that. I don't. I don't fully understand that. And can define it. Uh, I would like to be able to, but uh, uh, you'll, you, if you if you listen carefully, it's there. Is something has happened to us when, when Adam and Eve did their thing. Something happened to to nature to everything that we have no almost seem to have no control or we're just stuck in it and and until God comes I guess and does something we're, it's, it's not all in our control it seems to me that's right well we need to, there are other things we need to talk about in second Chronicles. we're doing just a bird's eye view here so let's let's uh, n the next question somewhat unrelated to that is if you read through second Chronicles you discover some very interesting things. Um, let me pick an example. If you go to Second Chronicles 9 and you go to verse 29, you'll read this, my Good News Bible. The rest of the history of Solomon from beginning to end is recorded in the history of Nathan the prophet and the prophecy of Ahijah of Shiloh and in the visions of Iddo the prophet. Would you turn to that for me, please? You give me the book, I'll turn. <laughs> <laughs> Are those inspired records? We know about Nathan, we know about Ahijah, we know about Ido. Well, just because we don't happen to have, there's been a lot of things inspired. I mean, if we kept everything that was inspired, <laughs> you know. But do you, does God book, inspire You wouldn't books? be able to get the book in this room. <laughs> if, does God inspire books that aren't recorded? If we, if we found one of these, would you put it in your Bible? 
I don't know. It depends on what it says. Well, okay. it's a good thing God and His providence kind of put the the Bible together, and I didn't have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So, well, if it stood up to the test that all the rest of this is measured to, then we'd stick it in there, make it a little thicker. If you if you look, you'll find out that in Second Chronicles, there, are, in addition to those, there's the Book of Samuel, the seer. Um, there's the um, let's see the prophet concerning. Uh, the visions of Ido, the prophet concerning Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the book of Shemaiah, the prophet, the genealogical register, Ido's history of Judah, annals of the kings of Israel and Judah, the book of the law of the Lord, the annals of the kings, the annals of the kings of Judah and Israel, the annals of the prophets, the collection of laments. There's a whole lot of books that quotes from basically here in, 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 in Scripture. What do we do with those? We don't have them. We don't have them, so we're not going to do anything with them. Okay. So what's the problem? Just because it's mentioned in the Bible that, and it's not in the Bible, that's a problem? Well, the, there's uh, two questions. One question is, if all those things were inspired and therefore quotable in the Bible, then why didn't God preserve them for us? That's the first question. The second question, if they're not inspired, why are the inspired writers quoting from them? That assumes that everything that inspired is supposed to be in Scripture. Where, where do we get that assumption from? I, I'm, I'm just asking. <clears throat> and, and that assumes that everything inspired is inspired for all time. Maybe it's only inspired for that time. The local situation. But yeah, the local situation. And, and you, can't, you can't even put it to well, somewhere else. It's got to be in that place. Let me, hold on just a minute. There are a lot of prophets we know the names of who prophesied many things, who never wrote anything down, and we say, yes, they're prophets. They did their thing locally. They, they, they were fine. They accomplished their job. But Not those canonical prophets. Well, you could call them what you want. I'm just saying they're named in the Bible. They did their job. Yeah. Okay. But they didn't write anything down. That we, this, I don't know. That we, they, have, that, we, that we have recorded. That we have recorded. These specifically are mentioned as having been written down. Does that make a difference? No. So these all sound like they are books of facts, books of history, mm -hmm. probably books that are correct. If, if something is correct, that doesn't necessarily make it God-breathed, God-inspired, mm -hmm. but it is correct. So but it's all right for, for <clears throat> a prophet who is inspired to quote from a book that's correct, even though it's not inspired. It's fact, absolutely. Okay. You see, the, the reason this is, becomes an issue is there are those who believe that every word in Scripture is God-breathed, and it was like dictated, and God wrote it down. Well, this sounds like it didn't work like that. Because it's not in there? Well, because here's all the way through Second Chronicles, he's quoting all these other books. Well, it says every word here is God-breathed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say every God-breathed word is here. No, but... But is this all God breathed? Just because it's a collection. I'm saying is that this doesn't. God didn't dictate Second Chronicles. No, I don't think. It so. looks like it looks like somebody was collecting information here and there and there and there and there and all these different places. A lot like and Luke. A lot like Luke. And was inspired to do so. And was inspired to do so. so and it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. So the net result is this: is it's inspiring. And as we so, read it, we're inspired. Mm -hmm. So you the have Holy to reject Spirit. that idea about mm -hmm. what inspiration is, that inspiration means mm -hmm. that it's God dictated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a very interesting prayer found in Second Chronicles. It has to do with the dedication of the temple. Look at, uh, look back at, uh, I'm just going to, we obviously don't have time to read the whole thing. It's a very lengthy prayer, but I want to notice a couple of things. Look at the end of Second Chronicles 5, the very end, last part of a verse mm. in Second Chronicles 5. As the pre now, this is at the dedication of Solomon's temple. As the priests were leaving the temple, it was suddenly filled with the clouds, shining with the dazzling light of the Lord's presence, and they could not continue the service of worship. Sounds pretty impressive, right? Well, then they have a long prayer by Solomon. Look at, jump over to 
chapter 7, verse 1, when King Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and burned up the sacrifice that had been offered, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled the temple. Because the temple was full of the dazzling light, of the, dazzling light the priests could not enter it. When the people of Israel saw the fire fall from heaven and the light fill the temple, they fell face downward on the pavement, worshiping God and praising Him for His goodness and His eternal love. What does that suggest? To, how many of you have seen a, te, a, a, a church dedicated in that way? Filled with the glory of God? Mm -hmm. mm, not recently. Not recently. <laughs> Earlier <laughs> in your I've, life, I've, right? No, I've never <laughs> seen that. Well, you've got to admit, this kind of fireworks, so to speak, is very impressive to people. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. But you wonder if what if what's a pr impressive is actually the best truth or not. Mm -hmm. And so, because of this remarkable manifestation of God's presence, <clears throat> it is reasonable to assume that everybody in the camp or everybody in the nation was all perfect and wonderful and all of that. Now that's well, an interesting well, assumption. Where'd you get that one? Well... Because Why it's would never God happened come before. Down I guess probably some of it stems from the conversation we were having before we turned on the cameras. But <laughs> 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 this is an ongoing discussion. <laughs> A lot of people don't realize we're more heated before we turn the cameras on. But um, well, it doesn't I mean? Wouldn't do we assume? I mean, if things were bad, would he show up like this? And I don't know. Maybe it's because things were bad that he had to show up this way. <laughs> well, but the, if you look at the context, the building of Solomon's temple is probably the high point in Jude, Judean, Israelite, Hebrew history. At that point in time, they were just about as high as they were going to go. They, they ruled over a huge amount of territory. They were probably the most powerful nation in the world at that point in time. There was gold flown through, and silver flown through the streets of of Jerusalem so much that they, you know, thought it was like co stones. But this wasn't the only time that this happened. No. I mean, this happened out in the tent in the desert. It happened out in the tent of the desert. Read the last few verses yeah. of, of Exodus. And, and so, uh, I think this is God <clears throat> saying, I accept this house as my place mm -hmm. of residence with you people. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's saying anything about the condition of the people. And this, this appears to have been a, a system that God used. This is a Shekinah, and you know, it was like you mentioned with Israel in the desert, and it followed the tent, and it would come and go, and it would lead them and so forth. And uh, I guess another question is, how come we don't do that today? How come when, we, how come when the Baptist church down here dedicates their temple, how their church or something, no matter how big or small, or whatever the group, they're, they're coming together, I think, with the best of intentions. And why doesn't God come in and fill that sucker up? That's right. Maybe he does, but not <laughs> with that manifestation. Well, it's interesting. We looked at last time in our discussion, we looked at Haggai. And in Haggai, it says, there's more glory in this final temple, the third temple, and there was nothing like this when it was dedicated. Yeah. No manifestation of God's glory whatsoever. Well, as it's recorded in here, there was a time when the Shekinah departed and never returned. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what is the more glorious, and we talked about that last time, that God actually considered the more glorious thing was when Jesus, in his dusty clothes, in his simple garb of a carpenter or a laborer from Galilee, walked into that temple and sat down in the corner where everybody could see him and started teaching. That was what God was interested in. Not the gold, not the silver, not the jewels in Solomon's temple. Those were all impressive, and the display that God made was impressive, but it was a lot more impressive in God's eye, in, in the eyes of heaven to see Jesus standing so, there so, and preaching. So what's more impressive today? That's the question. I, I guess my, my, my answer to that would be, uh, without a great deal of, uh, initial thing come to mind, without a great deal of education or theological fortifications for this, but probably uh, <clears throat> when the Lord comes into the human heart, or into the human temple. And where's your verse in the Bible for that? 
It says over Jesus himself said, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents and over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So it sounds like we're talking about impressing God versus impressing us. Well, As partly that's true, but what we're really talking about is what really matters in the great controversy, what really matters in long-term uh, history of, of, of our universe. And what matters in that context is what God does. When God comes down and manifests himself, that's what really matters. Not the fact that, I mean, we know that all the gold, all the silver, all the jewels belong to God. And if he, if he doesn't think he's got enough, he can make a billion tons more, snap his fingers, he can have it. So a bunch of gold, a bunch of jewels doesn't impress God. We're not that we're trying to impress God, but we're, we would like to do something that would make him happy. Because look at everything he's done for us. So really the only thing we're given the, <coughs> the power to do is to give our will. If we have a sin, we're willing to give it up. Uh, say, Lord, I put my will on, in to you. And then by faith, we accept his promise of correcting that problem in us. And it's, it's not a matter of earning anything. It's a matter of uh, my will, my every energy is dedicated to you. And then he does what he always does, makes things right. Let me pick another spot before we run out of time. Look at Second Chronicles <coughs> chapter 7, starting with verse 11. Now, when Moses came near the end of his ministry, Deuteronomy 28 and 29, he gave a list of blessing and curses. Compare this, 2 Chronicles 7, this is God appearing to Solomon. After King Solomon had finished the temple and the palace, successfully completing all his plans for them, the Lord appeared to him at night. He said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have accepted this temple as the place where sacrifices are to be offered to me. Whenever I hold back the rain, does God do that? Or send locusts, does God do that to eat up the crops? Or send an epidemic on my people. Does God do that? If they pray to me and repent and turn away from the evil they have been doing, then I will hear them into heaven, forgive their sins, and make their land prosperous again. I will watch over this temple and so forth. Drop down to verse 17. If you serve me faithfully as your father David did, obeying my laws and doing everything I have commanded you. Is that what you remember about the story of David? No. I will keep the promise I made to your father David when I told him that Israel would always be ruled by his descendants. But if you and your people ever disobey the laws and commands I have given you and worship other gods, what do we read at the end of Second Chronicles? They filled up the temple with pagan yeah. gods, right? Yeah. If they worship other gods, then I will remove from you the land I gave you. I will abandon this temple that I have consecrated as a place where I am to be worshipped. People everywhere will, rid will ridicule it and treat it with contempt. The temple is now greatly honored, but then everyone who passes by it will be amazed and will ask, why did the Lord do this to his land in this temple? People will answer, it is because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their ancestors out of Egypt. They gave their allegiance to other gods and worshipped them. That is why the Lord has brought this disaster on them. And with regard to your angel question, I think they understand this process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. We're going to turn in just a moment. Don't go away. We're going to turn to the story of Esther. And that has some real interesting parts.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're making, taking a sort of aerial view through Scripture, and we're just picking some of the high points, uh, the things that might add, affect our <coughs> attitude toward God in looking at some of these books. We're now going to look at Esther. Now, if you remember very briefly, the story of Esther is here was a beautiful young woman raised by her cousin because her parents were dead, who ends up being drafted in a, some kind of beauty contest, ends up being the king's wife, uh, principal wife, we don't know exactly what her official position was, um, and then because of Mordecai and some of the things he did, Haman becomes angry, uh, tries to arrange for the Jews to all be eliminated, um, Esther arranges for things to happen and they are saved. So what kind of a story is that? What does it teach us about God? Um, let me read just these few notes. It seems odd that the awareness of God and even the people of God brings out the worst in some people. God, the source of all goodness and blessing and joy, at times becomes the occasion for nearly unimaginable acts of cruelty, atrocity, and evil. There's a long history of killing men and women simply because they are perceived as reminders or representatives of the living God, as if killing people who worship God gets, gets rid of God himself. We've recently completed a century marked by an extraordinary frenzy of such God killings. To no one's surprise, God is still alive and present. The book of Esther opens a window on this world of violence directed, whether openly or covertly, against God and God's people. The perspective it provides transcends the occasion that provoked it, a nasty scheme to massacre all the exiled Jews who lived in the vast expanse of 5th century B.C. Persia. Three characters shape the plot. Mordecai, identified simply as the Jew, anchors the story. He is solid, faithful, sane, godly. His goodness is more than matched by the evil and arrogant vanity of Haman, who masterminds the planned massacre. Mordecai's young, orphaned, and ravishing cousin, Esther, whom he has raised, emerges from the shadows of the royal harem to take on the title role. It turns out that no God representing man, men and women get killed in this story. In a dramatic turnaround, the plot fails. But millions before and after Esther have been, and no doubt will continue to be, killed. There's hardly a culture or century that doesn't eventually find a Haman determined to rid the world of evidence and reminders of God. Meanwhile, Esther continues to speak the final and definitive word. You can't eliminate God's people. No matter how many of them you kill, you can't get rid of the communities of God honoring, God serving, God worshiping people scattered all over the earth. This is still the final and definitive word. And that comes from where? That's from the introduction of the book of, of Esther in the Message Bible. Now, is, is Esther a secular story? Well, that's a question. Uh, what about that? If you look at Esther, um, nowhere is the name of God or the act of prayer mentioned in the book, but God's clear overwhelming providence is the main theme. And obviously there are many, many other things. In the Hebrew version of Esther, for example, the Persian king is mentioned 190 times in 167 verses, but the God of Israel not once. Now why would a book like that be in the Bible? How, how do we... How is it that we interpret that this is a, um, I know how I would interpret that this is a, a book of God's providence is because it's in this book and so I just naturally conclude that. But, you know, what if it was just laying out on the street someplace and yeah. somebody came along and, or it wasn't in here? Would we, would we? It's, it's well, really we a just, it has a just ending. I think that's what brings God into it automatically. You know, because it has such a just ending, and it's, the irony is very strong in it too. And well, it, was, so, it was written 400 years before Christ, mm -hmm. and there were still some conservative Jewish groups that refused to accept it as part of the Bible 400 years after Christ. But finally, it. And the question is, why? Why would the Jews preserve this book? Well, Esther, Esther through divine providence ends up saving. 
every Jew exactly. presumably in, in the world. And, and, pres and that's so. probably why the book is preserved. Yeah. Well, it could have been a classic story too, mm -hmm. very classic. Well, the Book of Esther has been called the secular book of the Bible, and you can understand why. Uh, but in actual fact, that's a mistake. Um, well, tell me what you think of the Book of, of Esther. What do you think of the plot? Why, why did this, uh, this plot happen to begin with? Because Mordecai um, stuck to his principles. Mm -hmm. And did what? and did not bow to Naaman. Before that, it's that these people of God are not where they're supposed to be. They did not take the opportunity to go back to Jerusalem and Judea. Okay, let's look at that it. history. Yeah, but, yeah, but that's not the plot though. This that's is 50 years, the this is 50 or 60 years after the Jews were begged twice. They were told, go back to Jerusalem, go back to Judah. And about 98% of them didn't go. And here are these people, and instead of going that direction back to going west, back to Judah, they went east. They didn't even stay in Babylon. They went further away from where God intended them to be. Now they're over in Shushan in Iran, what we would call, well, in Persia, what we would call Iran today. They went from Iraq to Iran. So God should have just not let that story work out like it did because they deserve well, this it. Is a, this is a very good <laughs> question. What, uh, what should God do with people who don't bother to do what he asks them to do? Well, you know, it could be argued that uh, <clears throat> finally the, the Jews end up doing what they were told to do several hundred years before, and that was get rid of the Amalekites. Okay. Because in the end, that's what happens in the story. Um, uh, the, Haman and his, and his honchos are Amalekites. And if you go back to the time of Saul, one of the first things Saul was told to do was go out and uh, create an act of uh, genocide upon, <laughs> upon the Amalekites. A terrible Why? Act. Why? What's, what's the story that goes back before that? Um, what was, well, it, what was the that first? That goes clear what? back to to uh, if you put, even that goes clear back to Goliath, doesn't it? Wasn't he an Amalekite? And before that, before that, as I recall, they were the ones that wouldn't let Israel go through their land. And before that, <laughs> okay, go way back. Been going pretty far back. The Jews, when they first came out of Egypt. They had just barely gotten themselves organized. They weren't even really organized yet. And the Amalekites said, we don't want anybody invading our territory. And they attacked them before they were prepared for war, before they had any war weapons. And that was the occasion where uh, Moses' arms had to be held up by, by Aaron and Hur. And when his arms were up, they would win the battle. And he got so tired, he put his arms down. They would start losing back and forth. That was a battle where the Amalekites had no reason whatsoever to attack the Israelites. And their idea is, we're going to get rid of these people. We're not going to mess with them. We're just going to wipe them out before they even hardly get across the Red Sea. And for centuries, they'd had an opportunity to, to see God acting in behalf of these people. Yes. And they still uh, wanted to annihilate them. And so what did God say to, Saul, to Samuel? I'm sorry, what did God say to, to Saul well, in his day? It wasn't very pretty. It wasn't go out and just kill the soldiers. He was supposed to kill all the men and the women and the children. And the animals. And, and the goats and the sheep and everything. Nothing was supposed why, to Why would God say such a thing? Well, that's a question Christians have to answer to that's people why I'm who are not you. Christians. We, we, we I'm, deferring, I'm uh, deferring to Gordon. <laughs> but we don't have to answer that question to the Almakites, Al Almakites any because longer. Because what they stood for <laughs> was such a temptation and poison to Israel mm -hmm. that if any of them were left, it would root its head up and Israel would be lost. This is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah over again. It is. And things were so wicked there that God said, you know, and they had an opportunity. These people had their opportunity. They, they turned it down. And God says, okay, you've had several hundred years opportunity to learn what I intended for you to learn. Israel isn't doing a good job of teaching, I admit that. 
but you're certainly not doing a good job of learning, and um, your, your time of probation is over. Is, uh, just a, a little aside here, is there such a thing as fasting without prayer? Probably not. But then we do get some prayer into this story. Well, it's not mentioned by name. but No, but the <laughs> fast is. Yes, yes. And, uh, and why did they fast? Well, the crisis that Esther faced demanded quick, earnest action. But both she and Mordecai realized that unless God should work mightily in their behalf, their own efforts would be unavailing. So Esther took time for communion with God, the source of her strength. Mm -hmm. Then I went on, read on down about the fast, and she mm -hmm. was asking the, the, the Jews in Shushan to, to, to join her in, mm -hmm. in this process. So indirectly there's some communication with God in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, a long time ago, the Greeks, someone <coughs> who spoke primarily Greek, um, decided to fix that problem. And they took the book of Esther, and in the Greek, the Greek version of the book of Esther, and they added some details about Mordecai and some details about Esther, and they put in a lot of prayers and other things like this, and then you have a modified book of Esther. But we don't accept that extra, those extra additions to the book of Esther as, as inspired. Should we, should then we, we complain because they're not here. Come on, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I may say something, uh, two verses prior to what Norm uh, just mentioned, this could be also for us, this is a beautiful verse where Mordecai says, look, the Lord is going to do it no matter what. He's got you, mm -hmm. and this is, this is possibly your time for, for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. So this is something that all of us can use today, each day in our life, whether we say something to someone, whether we witness, whether we tell the truth or tell a lie. Mm -hmm. For such a time as this, it's a mm -hmm. daily... Okay, so we look at this story and Esther does marvelous things and she saves the Jewish people and that's wonderful and Mordecai ends up being elevated to a high position in the government, which is all wonderful. But let, let's talk back up a little bit. Um, several of you here have daughters. How many of you want, would like your daughter to do what Esther did? No. No. I don't even I, have a I daughter. I think I'd vote no. against it. <laughs> <laughs> you think you'd vote against it? You know, what, we what? just don't think about that. <coughs> I just don't know. That's why I'm asking you. I want you to think. No, I don't really. We just think her, of her as a princess somewhere and that, that you know, she's very good. Okay, and, I'm going to back up a second. De I depend on the culture and the time. But why, why didn't God solve the problem here by sending a prophet or, or a man that could do something? Why a ravishing young virgin to marry a pagan king? I mean, that's, I mean, that's to a Jew, this is like anathema. And then change your names and to hide mm. it. Maybe, yeah. not, maybe not to the Jews there in Shushan. Persia. Okay, it's all right in Persia, but it's not all right in Judah. Well, no, they're just... They're, they're a long way from their, even from their spiritual roots. Okay. And I'm, I'm not saying that's the way it is, I'm just postulating, you know. But, but, I mean, why, I mean, you know, this young lady broke just about every rule in the book. Maybe not voluntary, maybe she didn't have her choice about most of it, <clears throat> but she still did. Well, if she didn't have a choice, did she break the rule? Well, if someone comes and, and takes us captive, mm -hmm. I don't know that we're breaking any rules if we're a victim. Mm -hmm. Well, there were some people that were willing to be thrown in the fiery furnace mm -hmm. for not for yes. doing something that they didn't have control over. So, well, If she is totally dependent on, on God uh, and in her communion with God, why did God put her in that position? Well, it doesn't say that, though. It doesn't mean, say... It doesn't say, you know, how deep her religious... Well, thing. when she's just going... Kind of assume it. But when she's going to do this act, she fasts and asks the rest of Judah to join her and... 
Back to Ken's prior question, would you want either of our no, daughters to but do that? that's... <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to bring it down to reality. Yeah. Would you want your daughter to do that? Okay, it, you would have to put it in, in the perspective of the United States being under the control <laughs> of mm -hmm. some other country, mm -hmm. and my daughter could save the country. You know, it, it wasn't... I don't know. It wasn't 150 years ago, <clears throat> and I think is probably the, the case in certain parts of the world today where a female will marry a male by choice <clears throat> in order to advance her, her financial security and the position of her family down the line. If, if I may, chapter, <coughs> chapter 2, verse 8, when the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought mm -hmm. to the citadel. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. It, it's not like Esther's out there on the street saying, hey, pick me, pick mm -hmm. me. You know, they were brought mm -hmm. to the kings. But, you know, if you go back a couple steps, who was it that God made her so good looking? I mean, who, who was it that made her so, so good looking? <laughs> Wasn't it God? Yes. And lovely. Mm -hmm. So, so and they're all, they're doing all this <coughs> stuff under circumstances, you know, so, so for some reason it's okay now. But I well, keep thinking about Abraham when he came into the um, Egyptian king, mm -hmm. remember? Yes. Don't tell him that you're married to me because, you know, and what did he do? He took her as his wife, and and it was a bad situation. God turned around and said, oh, "You're not supposed to do that," and and you know what happened. Yeah. And but this seems like um, they're doing the same thing, but the whole thing is blessed. You know, sometimes, I've, sometimes we tell our children, "You know, if you go to places where you're not supposed to be, the angels won't go with you." you know, That's a little bit way out. I mean, it, it, it's not theologically correct because we believe that God is everywhere, right? If, but here are people who are apparently not where God wants them to be, and yet he's working with them. If we, if we use an argument that, that makes him look good, not them. Yes. <laughs> God was at work here in order to make Esther so pretty then where does that leave me when I'm he so ugly? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I like that line of thought. Maybe we better leave that one alone. Yeah. A while. <laughs> but why do you think Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman? There's plenty of examples of other people in the Bible bowing down to other individuals in respect that, you know, they don't have to be God. I, I think I think the the demand of Haman here was was more than just because he was of a higher rank or something. I think there was some kind of a yeah. of a uh, uh, maybe they knew, maybe Mordecai knew that Haman <coughs> was a descendant of the Amalekites, and Haman, a descendant of the Amalekites, knew that Mordecai was a Jew. I'm suspicious there was something like like Jay is saying. There's something more that. Haman was asking be done than just mm -hmm. pay respect. And how would you feel if you were Mordecai and you just learned what was the result of your refusing to bow down? That the whole all the all entire Jews Jewish nation, all Jewish people were supposed to be wiped out. And it's because you refused to bow down. And why couldn't you rationalize, well, I'll bow down here and then, you know, that'll give us more time to solve this problem. We deal with it later on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what about these death decrees? Is this the only death decree in the Bible? No. <clears throat> Can you think of another? Shadrach, One or two? Well, I'm talking about more, yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I recognize in other individuals, but I'm talking about wholesale decrees to kill great groups of people. I can think All of two babies. specific and a, a third that we okay. mentioned earlier. That Moses, Mm -hmm. uh, at the time of Moses, all the male children were to be killed. Okay. At the time of Jesus, all the male children were to be killed. Okay. And then you discussed just a little bit ago that at the time that the Amalekites attacked the 
uh, children, of children of Israel, they tried to kill all of the, uh, it's yep. not exactly a death decree, but kind of like it. Yeah, well. Try to wipe out and here's, Satan trying to who, wipe out God's people. Who do you suppose? Now, obviously, if all the male children had been killed in Egypt, the Israelites would have been wiped out. If all the Jews had been killed in the days of Esther, the nation would have been wiped out. If all the baby boys in Bethlehem had been, been wiped out, including Jesus, what, what, would, what would be the deal? Who do you suppose would be, be behind those kind of decrees? That's not too hard to figure out, I hope. Well, the devil. The devil, Satan, absolutely. I think, and, and he, he sees it, and, and the devil must have seen several times. I mean, look at the flood. The devil said, if you just give me about one more generation and I'll win this war. There's one family left that are paying attention to God, apparently. And other times, you know, ooh, here's Abraham. He's like the only one left. You know, and God says, oh, well, let me pick him and I'll make a nation out of him. And you come down through history, this has happened repeatedly, different times, when the devil thinks he just about, and here's an example, right here in the story of Esther, uh, the devil said, this, I got my chance, wipe out the whole nation, and I will have won. What do we, what do, we do with things like that? How do we respond? So, was this a good thing or a bad thing, or what? This kind of sounds like God is jumping on an airplane and wait until the last minute to pull his parachute, you know, every time, and, and then, you know, most then he starts over again. Just, What's that? It seems like most of the times he intervenes, it's kind of at the last time. It's a, yeah, did, did, the habit did, of being what we perceive as late. So, I, Gary, I wanna, you're saying God is a, an adrenaline junkie? No, I, I just... Pulling, to I just pull the parachute at the last moment? It, it kind of looks like it, but... Um, I want to follow the story through before we run out of time. Mm -hmm. Do you think God was responsible for helping Esther win the beauty contest? Well, well that's if we say that uh, God made her beautiful. He was responsible, right? And it was probably more than beauty. It was probably her presentation and mm -hmm. so on. And mm -hmm. he certainly could have helped that. Nothing gets past his passive mm -hmm. his passive will. So you can make that you can ask that statement on everything that happens on mm -hmm. earth, mm -hmm. and it's always true, God has permitted it. So, what do you think the, the angels thought as they watched this story? Here's a young Jewess breaking all the rules, and God seemed to be blessing her in the process, and they're saying, God, what are you up to? Right? There's more to this story than you see. More to the story than you time. see. Did the story say she broke the rules? That was my question. What, well, are, what are all the rules that she broke? <laughs> Let's name she, seven she, or eight she, of them. Well, uh, the obvious one is that, you know, he says clearly you're not supposed to measure, you're not supposed to marry people that are outside of your, outside of, your, of Israel, for right. example. Just, you're not supposed to marry pagan he, kings. Part Until of he harem. takes them off into captivity and that there are nobody that's else not her breaking the rule necessarily part of the harem I think that they were they came and they saw oh, she's beautiful she's beautiful take she her could, bring her yeah, she could have hidden <laughs> oh I don't think so no <laughs> she was too pretty their reputation had gone before everybody knew her another interesting point that I'm, I'm just trying to hit the high points here um, that we, we need to think about. Um, every time in the book of Esther, when she mentions the kingdom that she was a part of, that the king was in charge of and so forth, it's Medo-Persia. Does that matter to us? Well, it, it's a good uh, historical uh, um, footnote. Okay, why it helps is to, it? It helps to va validate um, other things. Uh, like? In the book of Daniel. Like the book of the prophecies in the book of Daniel. We say it's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the, these four nations in sequence. And when we look, and we're going we're gonna to look next to Ezra and Nehemiah, and, and we're going to find out that they also call it Medo-Persia. 
And there's no place where these people who are contemporary say, yeah, it was Media and then it was Persia. None of that. So what does that tell us about, now our, some of our criti the biblical critical friends say, oh no, it was, it was Babylon, it was Media, it was Persia, Greece, and nothing else, we don't know about all that stuff that happened after Daniel. The book of Daniel was written a long time later, and it was a historical book, and all that kind of stuff, but that doesn't fit with what we read in contemporary books here. Very interesting. Well, one of the challenges of this book and Ezra and Nehemiah that are coming up is this. There's enough historical detail in these books, and it's far enough down in history, so there's lots of places we can corroborate these stories with other historical details. And the question I want to ask you is, do the stories of Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah, do, are they historically accurate? Is archaeology, archaeology dug up evidence about them? Absolutely. And they are precisely right. They can be dated down to, you know, within days in some cases, and they fit exactly. Now, there's some, there are parts that we can't document, but the parts that we can document fit exactly. That's interesting because some people try to say Esther is really no different than the book of Judith in the Apocrypha. The book of Judith in the Apocrypha is full of anachronisms and, and geological errors, I mean geographical errors and cities in wrong places and all this kind of stuff. It, it's not like, I mean the overall plot may be a little bit like Esther, but it's, it's not like Esther at all. Esther is a historical, factual book. What does that tell us about God? God cares about the details too. Well, and, and when his people, when he asks people to write, they write in the context of being in the situation, and they write accurately about the, about the information they're writing about. That's really important. Um, As opposed to the uh, Egyptians, yeah. who <laughs> yeah. only write half of the <laughs> story. And not just the Egyptians, a lot of the other ancient nations. Yeah. Nothing ever bad happens to the kings of those other nations in their own records. Yeah. We're running out of time, but we have seen here in, in Second Chronicles and Esther some interesting details about God and how he runs his universe and so forth that help us to maintain our faith. See you next week.